a secret safe house for gunned down Alliance airmen. We were betrayed, though. One morning, I came home to find the Gestapo on my doorstep. They arrested me, and Willem too, I later found out. They questioned me, and while they were skilled, I told them nothing. For three months, I was held in confinement and beaten, but still, I told them nothing. Until one day, I was led before a panel of judges and read my sentence. Death by firing squad. I didn't cry or beg for my life. I simply held my head high and said, Guten Tag, gentlemen, good day. It wasn't courage or bravery they saw there, I don't know. But it moved one of them to speak. He said, Miss Parsons, you should appeal your case. And so I did, and it was reduced to life imprisonment. So I was sent to Vecta prison, a working prison. But here I found a friend in the Dutch Berner, Wendelin von Wollitzer, a strong, brave, intelligent woman. We became the fastest of friends and we vowed to escape as soon as the opportunity arose. But now, like I said, Vecta was a working prison, and so we were set to work. My job was to prepare the igniters for charges that would blow up bridges. All I had to do each day was simply snip the ends of 17,000 wires. Not a hard job, but one that I was soon removed from. They said something about shoddy work and sabotage. I assured them I had no idea what they were talking about. And so I was moved to soft detail. Day in and day out, I would mend hundreds and hundreds of German socks. They weren't wired, but I can tell you this much. I sewed as many hard, uncomfortable little knots into those socks as I could possibly get away with. <laughs> but then finally, one day, fate smiled upon one woman and I. The Allies bombed the men's side of our prison. Our warden, she led us out into the courtyard, and she threw open the gates. She said, you can take your chances in here with the Allied bombs, or out there with the German bullets. Wendelim and I ran. We ran and we escaped, but we found ourselves with no food, no papers, barely any clothes, and deep in German territory. And now while Wendelin spoke fluent German, everything I spoke of spoke with a thick Canadian accent. So we devised plans, and we, two relatives, our papers lost, trying to find our way back to our family. Wendelin, my niece, would be looking after me, her aunt, who had a cleft palate, a speech impediment. This was our plan, to rely on, on her German speaking and my acting ability. I can tell you it was the role of my lifetime. And it worked. Much to our surprise, for weeks we traveled under this disguise, and we found ourselves at the Allied borders. Now here Wendelin and I became separated, but I allowed myself to be captured, and in whose company do I find myself but the northern Nova Scotian Highlanders? I'm Canadian, I tell them, I'm Nova Scotian. They don't believe me. They think I'm a German spy. I tell them my story, they still don't believe me. Who would? It sounds impossible to my own ears, but I tell it to them anyways. I tell it to them until I'm interrupted from behind. Mona? Mona Parsons? I turn around and standing in front of me is Captain Kelly White and Captain Vincent McLean, two gentlemen whom I'd gone to Acadia with here in Wilco. I could not believe my eyes, nor could they, but they vouched for my identity and I was finally safe. Willem and I were reunited shortly after this, but the war had taken a much greater toll on him than on me, and he passed away just a few short years later. I remarried, of course. An old family friend, Major General Harry Foster, as in Mona Parsons, wife of. And Harry and I moved back here to Wolfville. We lived just down on Main Street, number 646. And it was there that I stayed until my own passing in 1976. I received citations from General Eisenhower for my contribution to the war. And my picture still does hang down at the Legion where the boys stop in to say hello every once in a while. But you can see how wife of does not really tell my full tale. I mean, for goodness sake, the man whose wife I am isn't even buried with me. Harry is down in Kentville with his first wife. <laughs> so it does my heart good to see you all here tonight remembering me. For you see, my history is now your history. And this is a role that she plays on the ghost walks. If you haven't been on the ghost walk in Wolfville, that just gives you an extra bit of incentive to go and see what it's all about because, believe it or not, she's not the only character. I'm not sure how Mona would have felt that way, but at least she gets to have the star billing. Um, my name is Andrea Hill Lair. I am a graduate of Acadia. In fact, I liked it so much uh, after I finished my BA that I actually went on to get a master's in English, and I came back and did a master's in education. Not only that, I've been, so I've been a student here, I've been staff and I've been faculty. So, 
Uh, this is a familiar room to me. Uh, Mona Parsons, I uh, came across the story actually when I was working on my master's thesis and I was, um, I am by nature attention deficit and I was working on my thesis and trying to be a disciplined researcher and scholar and I came across this, uh, just articles, looking at articles. I was doing hi uh, theater history actually and I came across this one piece in the Acadia Bulletin that mentioned in September 1945 how this ex-Acadia woman had been found safe at the end of the war after having been a prisoner of war for nearly four years. I couldn't believe it. I went to Pat Townsend in the archives and said, show me the stuff, like there's gotta be stuff, ex-Acadia? You know, and she looked at me and said, you know, the name is familiar, but you'll have to go to the Wolfville Historical Society to get more information. So I eagerly sought out the Wolfville Historical Society Robbins Elliott was my contact, and he said to me, yes, a lot of us remember her, but nothing's ever been done. No book has been written, no movie has been made, no documentary, and he made it his life's purpose in a way, one of his life purposes, to make sure that I got access to the information I needed. So the first stop was to write a play about Mona called The Bitterest Time. Uh, friend Sarah Blenkhorn and, and some other friends we created this play because, not because we had information and knew what we were talking about, but in the hope that, human nature being what it is, we'd produce the play and people would just flock to us to tell us what we'd got wrong, <laughs> what we'd missed. Boy, were we disappointed in that respect. But how we were not disappointed was the impact that this story had on people. We went to the Fringe Festival, and I'll never forget the first night of the performance. There were seven people, six of whom were sitting in the front, and at the back was uh, one of the, somebody from the Chronicle Herald who was covering the story. Now, five of the six were actually audience. The sixth guy was a veteran who'd actually been in Holland, like my dad, like Robbins Elliott, had been there at the end of the war. And he couldn't believe he'd never heard this story before. So he just sat there, because my jaw was just hanging open most of the time, going, I don't believe I don't know this story. Anyway, at the end of it, two of the people were from Holland, and one woman's uh, fiance had been a prisoner of war. So she had tears in her eyes at the end when she came up and said, thank you for telling this story. Two others were from Newfoundland, from uh, Theater Newfoundland, and they were preparing to do that fall, Billy Bishop Goes to War. And they said, boy, I'll tell you, if we'd known this existed, we wouldn't be doing Billy Bishop, we'd be doing Mona Parsons. And I think in that instance, I thought, you know what, it's gonna be my life's job to make sure that her name and that image is as well known as Billy Bishop's because though this woman never wore a uniform, never carried a gun, she was willing to put everything she believed in on the line to stake her life on it for freedom, for justice, and she nearly paid with that life as you heard in Amanda's story. So that began the search. And I owe a huge debt of gratitude to Robbins Elliott, who is unfortunately no longer here, but I know he's listening. Because he was the one who managed to get the funds, and I believe he paid a lot out of his own pocket for me to go to Holland, because I knew there was only so much I could get here. And the people, including the woman she'd escaped with, was in Holland. And so that began that section. I was over there three times doing research. But um, let me get a, getting a bit ahead of myself. Mona. <coughs> was born to Mary Keith and Norval Parsons. Now, Norval, as you can see, is in a uniform. I love this picture because, think about it, you know, we've had Afghanistan and we've seen people divided about exactly whether we should be there, why we're there, whether this is a worthy cause, a noble cause, whether it's just a waste of life. But in World War I, it was very much a matter of honor for many people to sign up didn't think of it. It was the big adventure for the younger men. And for the older men, they kind of wanted to get a little piece of this, and Norval was no different. Now, he was part of a reserve unit, and when the war came along, he was actually a little too old to enlist. So he just deducted a few couple of years off his, off his age, went and signed up, and of course his two sons, um, uh, now the name escapes me, uh, Glynn and, or sorry, Gwyn, and Ross uh, signed up as well. Now, Mona was 15, or sorry, war broke out. She was born in 1901. This, this is her actually living in Middleton. She's seated on the left with some friends 
Uh, she attended the McDonald's <coughs> Consolidated School, which is now the, the museum in Middleton. But when she was 10, there was a huge fire and her father's business, uh, the Parsons Elliott Company, uh, burned to the ground. And so he looked at this as possibly an opportunity to start elsewhere. He moved to Wolfville, and his occupation on the census is listed by Times a uh, businessman, but also stockbroker. So he was in investments, um, not exactly a gentleman of leisure, but certainly a man of means. And Mona was the only surviving daughter and the youngest child. So she was doted on just a little bit. She was daddy's little girl. And as she grew up, she took on some of her father's interests, horticulture. She loved gardening and everything that her father did. In fact, it was a little bit of affectation, but a great deal of affection that for the rest of his life, Mona referred to him as the Colonel, which was the rank that he attained during the First World War. 